We know, as we deal with situations practically, that we may have to do things that go against our feelings. And it's the same with helping people when you have to, uh, whom you don't like, you don't want to help, but on the whole, uh, it's rather necessary to do so. But don't ever be dishonest in playing that your feelings are not what they are. Now, from this standpoint, we can perhaps understand something about the deep relationship between morals and mysticism. If we go back, you see, to the experience that I described as mystical, we see that it is the vision, I tried to put it fumblingly in the sense of the rightness, the harmoniousness of everything that you are from one moment to another. That in other words, human behavior, its ups and its downs, is no different in principle from the behavior of the clouds or of the wind or of dancing flames in the fireplace. As you watch the pattern of the dancing flames, they never do anything vulgar. Their artistry is always perfect. Ultimately, it is the same with human beings. We are just as much a part of the natural order as flames in the fire or stars in the sky. But this is only apparent to the person who is honest in the sense in which I have spoken. In other words, the person who uh, is tied up with trying to pretend that his feelings are other than what they actually are. He can never see this. And he's always a troublemaker. He is the original hypocrite. The person who is unbelievably destructive is the person who pretends that he is a model of love and rectitude and justice and in fact isn't. Because nobody really can be. But then superior altogether is what the kind of person I would call the loving cynic. Who knows, of course, that everybody has his weakness and his price and so on. But isn't contemptuous for that reason. Incidentally, may I be so bold as to recommend a book. Memories, Dreams and Reflections by C.G. Jung. Jung's autobiography. The life story of a man who in my opinion, was a superb human being in this particular sense of thoroughly knowing his own limitations and of having a certain humor about them. A man who understood how to integrate into his whole being the devil in himself and the monkey in himself. So then, in the metaphysical sphere, the mystic is the one who feels that everything that happens is in some way harmonious, is in some way right, is in some way an integral part of the universe. Now when we transplant or translate that into the moral sphere, 
the sphere of human conduct. The equivalent is this. There are no wrong feelings. There may be wrong actions in the sense of uh, actions contrary to the rules of human communication. But the way you feel towards other people loving, hating, etc., etc. aren't any wrong feelings. And so to try and force one's feelings to be other than what they are is absurd. And furthermore dishonest. But you see, the, the idea that there are no wrong feelings is an immensely threatening idea to people who are afraid to feel in any case. And this is one of the peculiar problems of our culture. That we are terrified of our feelings. Because they, they take off on their own. And we think that if we give them any scope, and if we don't immediately beat them down, they will lead us into all kinds of chaotic and destructive action. It's so funny that we in our Western culture today say that kind of thing. We who do more chaotic and reckless kind of action than anybody ever did. But if for a change we would allow our feelings and look upon their comings and goings as something as beautiful and as natural and necessary as changes in the weather, the going of night and day, and of the four seasons. We would be at peace with ourselves. Because what is problematic for Western man is not so much his struggles with other people, and their needs and their problems as his struggle with his own feelings with what he will allow himself to feel and what he won't allow himself to feel the, he's ashamed to feel really profoundly sad so much so that he could cry it is not manly to cry he is ashamed to loathe somebody because you are not supposed to hate people. He is ashamed to be so overcome with the beauty of something, whether it be a natural landscape or a member of the opposite sex, that he goes out of his mind with this beauty because all that kind of thing is not being in control, old boy, not kind of having your hand on the wheel. <laughs> but it is because you see we don't go with that that we are not in control that we try to pretend that our inner life is different so I think this is the most releasing thing that anybody can possibly understand that your inner feeling is never wrong that's to say what you feel it's never wrong that you feel that way it may not be a right guide to what you should do in other words, if you feel that you hate someone intensely, it isn't necessarily the right way of dealing with that feeling to go out and cut his throat. But it is right that you should have the feeling of hating, or of being sad, or of what? Frightened, terrified, whatever it is. For you see, when a person comes to himself, he comes to be one with his own feeling. 
And that is the only way of being in a position to control it. It is in exactly this way that uh, the sailor always keeps the wind in his sails. Whether he wants to sail with the wind or whether he wants to sail against the wind, he always uses the wind. He never denies the wind. Well, in it's exactly that same sense that a person has to keep going with his own feeling. Whether he wants to act as the feeling obviously suggests or act in a different way, he has to keep the feeling with him because that's his own essential self. But when he attempts simply to sail against the wind, he's lost himself. He's become just a kind of empty uh, mask which hasn't got any real life behind it. And all its protestations of love and goodwill are hollow. So you see, it is in the most basic, simple situation. A mother has a child. She got it by accident. You know? And uh, she thinks, oh heavens, now I'm all tied up, full of responsibility and so on, I can't stand it. So I really didn't want to have it and I... Oh, 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 no, I mustn't think that thought. <laughs> all good mothers naturally love their babies. And so when she gets the baby, she says, Darling, I love you, but her milk is sour. <laughs> and the baby gets the other message. <laughs> and the baby's mixed up. And it would be much better if that mother said to the baby, Listen, you're a pest and you're a nuisance. And I didn't want to have you around. Well, then they understand each other. And everything's clear. There's no confusion. There's nothing mixed up here. And two, when you feel somebody is a pest and a nuisance and you, you really let it go and you tell them so, you're apt in a while to get a sense of a kind of humorous feeling about it. That... Uh, you can begin from telling them that they're a, they're a damn nuisance and I, I, I wish you'd just disappear and get lost. After a while, you say, yeah, you old bastard. <laughs> you know, and it begins to have a kind of affectionate feeling to it. <laughs> To sum up, what the mystic primarily feels is the divinity, the glory of whatever is. And when we apply that to the moral sphere, what is, is what one feels genuinely. And this must always be admitted, always allowed. It doesn't mean to say, let me emphasize this, it doesn't mean that we always are therefore compelled to act upon the basis of what we feel. That is to say, the, to kill the person we hate. Hatred does not necessarily lead to violence. It is unacknowledged hatred that leads to violence. 